Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Roa, and I work for Biodiversity for Livable Climate. I am here with Chris. He is one of the owners of Katana Station, and Katana Station is an area in northwestern Australia in the Kimberley. And this place is really special because they're managing the land holistically. Um, so this interview is just about Kachana Station, why that work is so important, why it should matter to us who live outside of Australia. And yeah, I want to pass it on over to Chris now so you can tell us more about your work and why do you think it's so important? Oh, thank you, Tanya, and hi, everybody. So I was actually born and raised in the former Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. So it's a similar the same latitude as, as here in the Kimberley and similar rainfall patterns, seasonal patterns, and similar ecological challenges as I was later to find out. And so for the past 35 years, we've been gathering local knowledge here on Kachana. And um, since 1970, sorry, since 1997, we've been fully focused on testing for locally relevant solutions. And that is in the face of, um, country that's dehydrating, uh, soils are eroding, vegetation's disappearing. So we lose, we, we've got uh, a lot of problems that we read about all over the planet. And what we want to do is find out what works and then trim our sails accordingly and learn how to get the forces of nature to fill those sails. Um, this is based on thinking that, you know, humans have capitalized on nature's bounty for forever. And nature put that bounty there in the first place what processes were in place, what processes enabled that wealth to be generated? Are those processes still around? To what extent can we discover them, influence them and, and, and help nature heal herself? So the learning curve has been very substantial time-wise, money-wise, although money-wise was probably more the, the opportunity interest, the fact, the fact that we could have spent the money somewhere else that's that that's where the main costs are but then also there's been uh, emotional costs but in the process we've had we've had some very rewarding results and we believe that these results actually have broader re relevance not only to kachana so before, i'm as i have been here for 35 years i want to start handing over the reins or i need to not i don't want to but i need to start handing over the reins so what we want is our our, our results to be subjected to rigorous scientific analysis and um, right now we are, we're in a situation where actually we have a departmental threat to deprive us of a significant management tool. And we're saying, well, before, before we do any too radical changes, let's, let's get the science behind it and find out where we stand. And, and as, as, a, as a business, we stand at a crossroads. So we're waiting for the court of public opinion, so to, so to speak, to decide what we've done in the last 30 years or so, is it desirable or not? and what, what's the scientific leg legitimacy there. And um, so do we continue to innovate with a focus on climate building, or do we now know enough to just remain financially secure and focus on legitimate extraction like a lot of other people do? So I guess that's, that's, the, that's where I stand. Thank you so, so much. So did you want to? <laughs> Are you getting a lot of feedback? Oh, um, sorry, we, we, we have a bad internet connection, it looks like. Would you like me to proceed with a, with a question about the roles of the animals that we have here? Or? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so, so you asked the question, what roles do the animals, including the wild donkeys, have? And are they necessary for, for restoring the land? So let, let's just put that in the context of a natural dryland economy, right? So we have solid physical foundations, land, uh, so rocks, um, sand, silts, and clays, everything that's locally available. That's, that's our, those are our physical foundations. And then the sun shines daily, and that's offering us close to unlimited free renewable energy. And on a seasonal basis, we get rain. So we have the abundant free potential for rehydration. And then we also have biology. And biology, we look at biology as the engine of life. So what, what we seem to find out these days is that what makes the engine of life really hum is biodiversity. So in the, in the local context, 
what we need to understand is um, um, the, the local context will determine what is biologically and ecologically and economically possible. However, the local biology, everything that lives, and that's, that's what determines what actually goes on. So now to actually answer that question, you know, where, where do we fit in as humans and our animals? As humans, we influence, we have influence on all the large animals on the planet, how they behave. So whether we have a doubt to have direct influence or indirect influence, the behavior of large animals on this planet is now in this day and age governed by human behavior. And the, the thing we understand now is that large animal behavior will determine the fate of vegetation. So the large animals in the landscape are literally the plumbers, the electricians, and the gardeners. They have a middle, they have a middle level management role that we directly influence as humans, as, as whether we are on site locally or whether we have a community that's impacting the land around us, we impact how these gardeners function. And the vegetation, now situation, we, well, we call it the lower level management because the plants, they gather the, the income, the daily sunshine that's beamed in on us. If it's to get into the economy and ultimately into our uh, hip pockets or whatever, into the, into the money, into our local economies or private economies, plants need to gather that, that, that in, some of that energy and push it into the economy. So, so uh, plants, um, the health of plants either drives or permits soil building and the flourishing of biodiversity, or it is a limiting factor. So as humans, we focus on, on profitability, but before profitability comes production, before production comes productivity. And for productivity to work in natural situations, we need all the management teams working together. So in our landscape for the past few decades, and that's long before we even got here, wild cattle and wild donkeys managed the vegetation without the supervision of humans, i.e. we had feral animals out there doing whatever they wanted. And the outcome of feral behavior was not desirable and it wasn't sustainable. So even though, the, even though those uh, donkeys were healthy all year round and the, the wild cattle were healthy during during certain parts of the season, it was a so what 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 we're seeing is we're trying as as humans we're trying to influence that behavior of those large herbivores to keep the vegetation healthy and they do that by by um, mulching what they don't eat they press onto the ground so that's so that's the and they prune plants to make them keep them healthy so that's that's where the donkeys come in in the inaccessible areas and the cattle are sort of in the lower easily accessible areas so they are our main middle managers the donkeys and the cattle and, and ideally we have them working together but they certainly have very just very big roles in our landscape and, and the reason why we're gathered here today is because unfortunately the it seems to be politically incorrect to use an animal that is by some people regarded as a pest species as part of the solution. But we're finding just like us humans, our behavior has got us into trouble. If we behave differently, we can get out of trouble. And just like the donkeys in the past have got us out of trouble in the early days when they were very beasts of burden and they organized all the transport, they ended up getting us into in, and themselves into trouble when we released them when, when they became superfluous with mechanization. And, and now we're saying, well, hang on, we can actually get them to function as their wild ancestors did in a landscape long before domestication and work together with them. So that hopefully answers the donkey side. Now we've got an unstable internet condition, uh, connections. I don't know if you were able to hear that. Yes, I heard it. Thank you so much. And- Right, yeah. I don't know how much I'll be able to talk. Um, there seems to be like an echo. So if I hear it again, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> but I did want to show everyone um, what amazing work you're doing. So I am going to share my screen just to show your website so everyone can see that. I mean, this is beautiful. And here you see the cattle over here and all these trees, the landscape is just gorgeous. 
And I mean, so much, speaking of like, as you said, Australia, when we think of Australia, we think of it as um, very dry. And this is quite the opposite of that. So yeah, what you're doing must be working. And here on the Wild Donkey Project page, we see what a difference it has, has happened over, what is that, about 20 years or so? I mean- That's so 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> Pretty well 30 years. Yeah. Well, actually when the photo was taken, it was earlier, yeah. But the, the, the initial transformation took place in the first five years and then it's just been slowly getting better, but it's, it's, it's turning, it's turning a downward spiral around and starting to get the native forces of nature to help build an up, uh, yeah, just reconstructive um, cycles or cycles and, and start for, uh, creating abundance in vegetation, abundance in soil life, hanging on to um, rain, raindrops where they fall rather than them hitting the ground and then taking, running downstream, taking loose materials with it or leaching out soil. So it's, 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 it's just trying to get the life building forces to build life again, rather than being destructive. Oh, definitely. <laughs> and my next question was going to be, why, why here? Why specifically um, Northwestern Australia? Why was this area so, so needed for restoration? Um, there are two parts to that question. It's first of all, we, we, we have, we're, we're in this, we're in a tropical latitude and what we're finding is we're having a high, we, 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 we've got high rainfall deserts, which, um, it seems to be counterintuitive, but we have a lot of rain and most of that just disappears. Our main water thieves are gravity. It just, just runs off the place before it can even do any good. Then because of this lack of vegetation, to slow it down, um, to, to, uh, well, the, the second thief is evaporation of bare soils. So what doesn't run off and goes into the soil, the soil's bare, it'll evaporate again. So we've, so they are two main water thieves. Then you have, in the absence of microclimates, vapor transpiration. So what the plants bring up out of the ground, and put into the atmosphere, there's no microclimate and the wind blows it away. So even though we get more water per capita than many people on the planet, it's it's we get it in a seasonal in, in, in seasonal hits, and if we don't manage it properly, it's not there for most of the year. So we end up with this yeah high rainfall desert, which and the the what 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 makes our little situation so special or unique is that we are faced with key challenges of that that face dysfunctional landscapes in seasonally dry landscapes all over the planet. So that's the dehydration, the loss of soil, and the loss of biodiversity. However, we still have access to water and sunshine. They're the main ingredients that nature gives us to work with. And nobody starves or dies whether we fail or succeed. So we can actually be experimenting without risking lives. If we were to conduct an experiment like this in a high density population area like in, Af in Africa or India, well, if we get it wrong, you know, people start dying. Whereas here, we're, we're starting we're starting below zero, we build reorganizing the foundations and building on foundations and working out what works. So, so what works here is relevant to other similar areas and we can invite people to come and work with us and experiment and learn and fail and you know, go through the learning curve in a situation where lives are not at risk. So I think that's, that's the great opportunity that we have here on Kachana is that we have solutions that we can, if we can get it right, other people can capitalize on the, those solutions by taking the knowledge away or even coming here and getting that, that uh, getting the skills and then taking the skills with them to their own contexts, which will be different. I love that. That's, love that. that's exactly what we need. And that does lead to my last question. Um, you are saying that you want more people to be aware of this and you want more people to get involved. So what can people outside of Australia who maybe may not be able to make it to Kachana Station, um, what can they do? And what was, what's your final message, I guess, for the audience? So, so for all the people who 
are not on Kachana and may not be able to come here, well, how does it affect you? Well, um, I think that we, we all need to understand that remoteness does not mean that there's no interconnectedness. Just because we're far away doesn't mean we're not connected. So we've got, an eco we've got ecosystem processes around us that connect all of us. And this connection we experience most commonly in climate and in health. In physical health or healthy communities, in climate that's conducive to, 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 to the thriving of communities or cultures, or in climate that deteriorates. And this is, this is where now we have this, 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 uh, this global awareness that we're in this together and um, climate instability ultimately affects everybody. And um, rebuilding climatic stability is a very doable enterprise. Nature's done it in the past and she works on it all the time. And the, the question is, um, what do we do with it? And, um, and, I, and I, the, the take home message that, 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 that we seem to be getting and that Nature Source is giving us is, is actually there's an insight that has guided effective medic, me, medical practitioners for centuries. And that is, it's a Latin phrase, it's medicus curat natura sanat. And that means the physician cares and nature heals. So for nature to heal climate, we now need a critical mass of humans who need to behave as land doctors and land carers. It's that simple. So, so the actual climate building which nature does can be achieved if we get a few a critical mass of, of, of actively engaged people and, um, for those, and, and because only few people can actually be out there doing these things, we need the rest of the community to, to back us. We need, we need, the, the, we need a partnerships between those out in the field, those in the community who gain understanding and who can give support, the, the governments who who regulate the, the structures, they need to be working together. We're all in this together. We need to work together. And if we rehydrate landscapes, everybody wins. And I guess that's that's the bottom line. Um, <laughs> so um, wherever you are, you can still join us in this because we're all part of it. Oh, yes. I love that. That's um, I couldn't have put it better myself. So... Thank you so much, Chris, for your time. What you're doing at Kachana Station with everyone else is amazing. And File for Climate is just happy that we get to do at least a small part in that story. So thank you again for spending some time with me. Well, thank you and your team, because a lot of small parts make the whole happen. And then that's what we're working. <laughs> it's not only this, it's not only it's not only our only bet. Nature's proved it in the past, so so we we can work in there with her and 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 sort things out. So there's plenty of room for for hope and yeah. All right, yeah. thank you, Tanya. We'll look forward to catching comparing notes another time. Yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>